This is Ed in San Diego, and today is 14 September uh, 22, and uh, welcome to Global TV Talk Show. Uh, in just a couple of minutes, we'll be welcoming our special guest today, Paul Falcone. Uh, he's been on our program several times. He's very well known as a, an author, uh, best-selling author, I'm going to read this, workplace leadership trainer, executive coach, international keynote speaker. Paul Falcone, Workplace Leadership Consulting. And he's written several books and the Harper uh, Leadership Group, uh, uh, Workplace Leadership. And there's a whole series connected with this. So uh, we'll be right back with Paul Falcone. This is Ed in San Diego, and welcome back to globaltvtalkshow.com. Uh, wonderful to have our very good friend, Paul Falcone, back on the screen. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Ed. So great to be here. Paul, I'm going to read this. Paul Falcone is a best-selling author, workplace leadership trainer, and recognized uh, worldwide for his insight and leadership as a CHRO for many years, Nickelodeon, uh, Paramount Pictures, um, NBC Universal, and some other activities connected with the entertainment industry. Welcome, Paul Falcone. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I appreciate it. That's a nice intro. I also, just so everyone knows, I also did healthcare and biotech and financial services. So I'm not only healthcare, but a, a good percentage of my time has been spent in healthcare over the last <clears throat> three decades. So <laughs> there you go. So um, in the past conversations we had, it was like uh, before the pandemic and then right as it started. And I remember you and I had this conversation just like in like March of 2020. And you said, it's really going to be tough. This is going to be the most challenging time for uh, HR leaders and for everybody else. And uh, we, we sure as hell saw that happening. And now the pandemic is hopefully passing, but the results are, are, are weird and strange. Uh, so the great resignation or the great reorganization or the great happening of self-awareness, that's what's driving all that, right? People right. want to do more. They had more time to think about themselves. They don't uh, want to stay uh, with allegiance to a boss who they can't stand. They may like the company, but they hate the boss. Isn't that right? Yeah, unfortunately, there's that old saying that people join companies, but they leave bosses, right? It, it's really that idea. You, you have this perception of, oh, I want to join this company. I want to be part of their success. I want to have their name on my resume. Two years later, they're like, get me out of here. I don't like this boss. I am not comfortable here anymore. I don't feel welcome and out the door I go. And I think to your point, Ed, it was a matter of you know, God rattled our cage with, with a pandemic. We may not have seen one in a hundred years. So there's really no one alive who can tell us and guide us through right. it. But people realize life is too short. And so you saw, you, you've seen this major scattering of, of people, both geographically, people saying, I'm not living in the cold anymore. I want to go to the warmer climates. Or you have people saying, I won't work for this company anymore. And, or I just, I'll do anything, but I won't wait tables. Well, the problem is the disconnect is companies want to hire people who have experience. So if you're looking to hire waiters and the only people not applying for jobs are people with waiting experience, <laughs> you're kind of stuck. There's your great resignation. And there was the blockage in talent that, that employers continue to face today. Okay. So people are into and many women, but not totally, um, recognizing that they have strengths and that they can now's the time to jump out and and try to do something on their own uh, or to coalesce or partner up with others who have that same idea they may not have any money but they have that same will and that same energy and so i've seen that i'm sure you have too yeah women in leadership is a topic that i'm writing about more i'm, I'm lecturing on more it's such a fun area and it's really when you look at the discrepancies out there in pay, I think there's still the rule is about 83 cents that a woman makes on, on a male, you know, you know, basically on a male's dollar. That discrepancy exists. When you look at 
Fortune 500 CEOs, when you look at the composition of boards of director, the reality becomes the female presence is, is being choked off at a certain level. And if we can kind of switch that valve and if we can make it such that women can access these higher levels, I, I mean, truthfully, Ed, this is the biggest advantage we have in the world, right? We can use 100% of our population. There are a lot of countries out there that really only use 50% or the male portion of their population. But one of the things they say is that males are judged on their potential, whereas females are judged on their performance. And if you've ever done a succession planning exercise- I never knew that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, so the statistics are there. So it's interesting. And if you ever look at a nine box exercise, which is the typical succession planning tool, where the, the Y axis going north is your potential and the X axis going off to the side is your performance. If they're judging men based on potential on the Y axis, axis, you certainly can see why men would tend to get the benefit of the doubt in the assumptions. If they tend to judge women on the X axis on performance, it means women have to basically kill themselves to prove that they're worthy. Combine that with the fact that what you're what we find in the studies that the various sociologists are doing out there is women tend to have almost half the level of confidence that men have for whatever reason, socially, whatever. When you take that lack of confidence and you take the fact that they're being judged on performance, women are working literally twice as hard to get to the same place that males are almost assumed to be. And that's the point we are in our development, in our own evolution as a society as we're moving forward with it. If we can figure out how to judge females on potential (laughs) rather than performance, we can switch that X and the Y axis um, everything can change very, very quickly. So, so it's a strong with, movement. It's happening. So the past year or so in particular, the last year, maybe two years, um, there must be some measurement going on or, or understanding of whatever statistics are of failures or successes of women-owned businesses. Um, you know, just the other day I did... Uh, a broadcast into Scandinavia. Um, we called it global business Scandinavia. And my two lead guests were both women from Sweden. And they uh, both had very senior level HR roles uh, within Swedish based companies like IKEA and a couple of other names that are big over there. But they each quit. Uh, and now they're forming a business or have formed a new little business called Future of Work, Ooh. right? And it's all about collaboration and what they call network, a network-based company, which is all about collaboration. It's almost exactly what you and even what I have been doing, uh, only that I didn't have that name. <laughs> I didn't know what it's called. I'm just doing it. But they put a name on it, network based company of Mm -hmm. collaboration and um, being community oriented and people centric. But you've been preaching that forever. Yeah, you know, I have as as part of, again, part of what I do is as a practitioner uh, with three decades of HR behind me. Part of it is what I do as a writer, um, because I've written now 15 books and got two more on the horizon coming down. <laughs> um, and I just opened up my own consulting firm about two months ago. So this is, this is a, a thank you, but it's a big change. <laughs> it's weird when you don't have a normal paycheck. I'm still kind of getting used to that, Ed, but I'll get there. The reality is, is part of a diversity program, outreach initiative, whatever, um, bringing everyone to the table is really what's critical. And it's, it, it, I can't say it's blind. It, it's more deliberate than that. One day we will get to a point where it's blind, where we just don't see differences in genders or races or ages or anything else. Right now, it has to be more deliberate and purposeful in terms of what we're doing to make sure that everyone feels like they have a voice. Writing about that for years is one thing because it truthfully has felt like theory. Where COVID has changed everything, Ed, is parallel example. When I was younger in my career, now in the 80s, 1980s or the 90s, you know, soft skills were like, yeah, nice to have, great HR, great HR idea du jour. Go back to your office, Paul. And if we ever want to do that, we'll call you, right? Now we're into remote work and all these different situations where the soft skills are really the most important thing. It's kind of come to its, its own fruition naturally because of the changed circumstances that remote work 
and, and COVID have created. The so, same, let me, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so let me jump in, if I may, here, while this idea is still percolating, because <laughs> um, it may go away in a minute. But um, it's called networking. But back in those, in those days, I remember it was like the old boys club. Right. You know? But now it's networking and network, which means sharing the job or finding someone who can partner with you uh, to do a job and then move on. It's almost like being in the movie business where Spielberg or somebody brings together uh, the director or the photographer or the this or the that. They do the job and it's done and they move on to other projects until another time gig yeah very much so I, I i think you took the words out of my mouth the funny thing is we're seeing that parallel with what was happening with soft skills before which are now critical what was a nice to have was are you doing things for women employees in your company that mindset is gone it's like no it's time to bust right through that okay i know there is a glass ceiling i'm not naive but i do think there are chances now to bust through it and we're going to see that whether it's through legislation where states pass rules that say, you know, publicly traded companies must have X amount of female rep representatives on the board of director. Or if we see that, truthfully, the movement that's going to come from the Gen Y and the Gen Z, these are the two most studied cohorts uh, in, in world history. We know what the 35 and under uh, millennials want and the 25, under, 25 and under zennials want, the Gen Z. And diversity, equity, and inclusion is one of their top five in study after study after study. So is corporate social responsibility. So is environmentalism. So is work-life balance and control and professional and career development. Those movements are what you're seeing. And I know it as an HR practitioner because it floods my inbox. I'm constantly getting emails from people saying, Paul, we can help you with your diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging initiatives. Why is that all of a sudden so big? Because they've studied what the generations want. They now make up about 45% of the U.S. working population, but that's changing every year. Those numbers are going up exponentially. Wise employers will sit back and say, what does the 35 and under crowd want? And if one of their top issues always happens to be diversity of thought, of, 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 of ideas, of people and voices, companies are going to be smart to make that their own initiative. Yeah, so that younger generation wants companies to be more socially active, sort of like the 70s, but different. Um, but they want a better world for themselves and for their kids, perhaps, right? Correct. And so what does that better world mean? That means less pollution, more equality, rather than, you know, the word diversity is like, it's almost opaque now. So what does it really mean? Uh, and you need to find examples every day almost of what that means, right? Yeah. And these are good values though, Ed. That, that's the thing to keep in mind. I mean, the thing about it is there are some CEOs, I'll give an example, that say, COVID's over. I don't want to hear the word again. Everyone's back to work Monday to Friday, eight to five. And if I hear anyone asking about the word remote or the word COVID, like you don't belong here anymore. And that rigidity does exist. And there's a part of me that says, this is my own generation. I'm a baby boomer. I was the end of the baby boom, but still a baby boomer. And you know, this, I, I, this sense of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And you know, I did it on my own. Fierce independence, meh, I get it. I understand that. But you also, you can't just shut down rigidly and say, it's my way or the highway. The younger generation is gonna look elsewhere. They're not comfortable recruiting people into an environment where there's no flexibility because candidates are asking, do you have, what, what's your policy on remote work and how does that work in your organization? If the recruiter is shut down and saying, I'm sorry, we don't recognize that in our company, you're going to find out that people are disappearing in, in the process because they want to be part of a company that's hip, that's not tone deaf, that's listening to the needs of its workers. That will, that will continue. This is not going to go away two years from now. 10 years from now and 20 years from now, I think the generations that are alive now have learned enough from the last two and a half years that this is now embedded in their psyche. They, they, they've carved new neural pathways. This is in their brains. This is what they want. A company would be tone deaf to just shut the door and make believe it never happened. So this, this is not a political program, but what we're talking about is part of a political movement 
um, where the bias more talked about rather than not talked about. Uh, everything from global warming and this crazy weather to um, the people. Uh, and this thing called quiet quit or quiet. Quiet quitting. Uh, it's almost like present, being present and just doing the minimum and hoping no one will recognize it. Right, which they call presenteeism, <laughs> which is like absenteeism. It's, uh, <laughs> they're there, but they're not getting anything done. Yeah, the quiet quit is part of this too. These are people who will stay in the roles, but really they've ca- they've checked out mentally. Uh, you know, and they're looking ago. for a job, right? Or thinking about looking, it. Probably, yeah. And companies are carrying that and they don't need that. I mean, the funny thing is that this is easier than we're making it. You can do a lot of this on the back of a napkin. This is just pure common horse sense about what is it that people have learned and make yourself the average bear. If you're that CEO, if you're that head of HR, what is it that people have learned? What is it that you've learned? And how do you incorporate that into the company and give voice to it so that people feel like you care about them? That's what they want. That's what all these issues are about. This is a generation that doesn't know how to disconnect. They're constantly online. They're constantly tethered to work. Work doesn't stop for them. That's why they need more balance. And they're hoping the companies can step in to help them know that it's okay to disconnect mentally from, from an email, right? Not do work till 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. But that's the reality for a lot of people out there. And even if they choose to do it, if they feel like their company has their backs and has their better well-being in mind, they'll do it in a much healthier way sense where there's no resentment for what they're going through. But there's a scattering out there right now. People don't know. One other thought, Ed, and this is important. I heard a lecture at my last company, the Motion Picture and Television Fund, which is a healthcare nonprofit. And the uh, the doctor who was doing the presentation said, listen, you're working primarily with elderly retirees at your organization. They are not the most isolated and the loneliest generation on the planet. It's Gen Z, the Xennials, the 25 and under. They are the most disconnected, isolated, and lonely because they don't have the human contact. Everything they do is through electronics and they're suffering for it. The employer has to be the one to extend the olive branch, make it more social for them and bring them together because technologically, that's how they're wired. They need to learn the social element more and it can really help. How do you talk the language? I don't worry about talking the language. Don't don't get too carried away and oh, I don't speak the language of 25 and under. That language changes every day. The, the language they need to hear is your heart. They'll know if you're being sincere and they'll know if you care. And whether you use language or not, that they'll understand is it really, really an issue here? People read what's in your heart. That's more important. That's great. That's good stuff. So Tell me about your uh, your Harper Leadership Series. Um, it's very interesting. The design of uh, all those books are they look almost the same, but that's part of the branding, isn't it? That it's all a consistency. Yeah, correct. What I did when Harper Collins approached me about writing the Paul Falcone Workplace Leadership Series, my first thought was, "Wait, my name is the title?" And they're like, "Yes, it is." I said, "Okay, I'm in." <laughs> but it was really about the employee life cycle. For me, I like leadership in the trenches. How do you build frontline operational leadership muscle, whether at the manager level or the vice president level, whatever it happens to be. It's amazing to me. I've worked in really good companies, large and small. What misses awareness out there and people stepping on landmines left and right. That's where my writing is always focused at. And for me, it was very logical. It started with interviewing and hiring and onboarding. That's the logical place to start. Then it goes to leadership offense and leadership defense strategies. How do you motivate them? How do you hold them accountable and or terminate if it's not working? Then it moved into a book on workplace ethics because you have to have ethics nowadays more than ever. And it's very practical. People think ethics are like philosophical, blah, blah, blah. It's not. This is like real stuff in the workplace. And then the fifth book is a book for new managers because Harper Collins said, Paul, that's really where our big demand is, our biggest demand. Could you write a book for new managers? And that made up the five book series. So let me ask you, if I could, uh, not to be critical, but just to go into a dive here, a deep dive for a second. Um, one of your books is How to Have Difficult Conversations. Um, where does that title fit into that group you just mentioned? Very good. This is leadership defense. 
So the book on leadership defense, the accountability piece is how do you hold tough conversations with employees that still help them retain their dignity and respect, but you know, reinvent uh, expectations with them going forward. That book on leadership defense also talks about documentation, which is another one of my books that I know you're aware of the 101 sample write-ups for documenting employee performance problems. You have to know how to structure terminations. You have to know how to insulate your organization from liability. And documentation doesn't happen enough out there. And truthfully, sometimes when it does, it does more damage than it helps. So, you know, training managers on the leadership offense, the motivation, the coaching, the, the, the encouragement, training them on the leadership defense to protect themselves, protect their organization. Those are kind of logical bookends for me as part of this life cycle series. What about the uh, aspects under that umbrella? aspects of upskilling, you know, nonstop learning, um, upskilling or reskilling the, the workforce um, and using that as an engagement tool. There is no better engagement tool. I've always said training is the glue that binds someone to the organization. When people feel like they're in a learning mode, it's not just good for the company. It's good for their resumes. It's good for their LinkedIn profiles. It's good for their sense of self-esteem. No one wants to feel like they're treading water career-wise. And truthfully, Ed, for the last two and a half years, a lot of people have felt that way. So that once the market started to open up after the COVID, the, the really bad part of COVID, which we saw with the alpha variant and the delta variant, Omicron is still out there, but it's not putting people in the hospital or causing the death percentages the same way. Well, anyway, you're seeing the scattergram. Again, people are looking to make up for lost time. If you want to retain your best and brightest, engage them now in a learning curve that they're interested in, that builds their resumes and helps them contribute to your company more. What about this aspect of being people-centric? Uh, that's so obvious. sounds obvious, but um, as a, what, a communications device, a retention tool? You got to be a little careful with that. I think employers, if everyone is using the term, <laughs> it kind of gets whitewashed, right? It's like, it's just noise in the background. Mm -hmm. If you really want to describe yourself as a people-centric company, you're going to need to talk about it and you need to sell people. When someone runs an ad, when you see job ads, they usually talk about the job 90% and maybe one or two lines about the company. You need to switch that paradigm. You need to be talking 80% about your company and 20% about the job because people join companies, not so much jobs. And I think if you can take that time to talk about why you're employee centric and what that means to you and why you're keeping up with the times and putting your employees needs ahead of your own and expecting them to respond in kind, this is the essence of selfless leadership. There was that essay in 1970 by Professor Robert Greenleaf called the, the Servant Leader. And it's still available on, you know, you can go to Amazon and get it. But the whole idea was when leaders are in a position to put others' needs first, they end up creating more leaders in turn. And that makes the whole, you, you know, the expression, all the boats rise when the when the tide goes up. Yeah. It's that same idea. I've always written about that because that is truthfully how I've led my career. I would hope the people who have worked for me would say the same thing. Um, but it's the easiest way to get to the top, in my opinion. It is not a shark tank. It is not a dog eat dog world. These people are all the same. They're all trying to do their best in given the circumstances. But when they have someone they can trust and believe in, they don't leave. And that's the key to good retention. They want to stay with their boss. This is feedback. The, the value of feedback. Yeah, very much so. And communication. And the problem is the path of least resistance is avoidance. People don't want to give negative feedback. But at the same time, when you pull these two generational cohorts, one of the top five things they want is career and professional development. That's only going to come from feedback. So the point of that 101 Tough Conversations book was the, the velvet glove approach. How do you give feedback in a constructive way that can be taken positively, that doesn't make people feel guilty or make them feel bad, engages them, encourages them to, to put that next best step forward. Uh, as we come to a close here, uh, regretfully so fast, <laughs> but uh, what about this uh, concept, new, con new concept of, I'm not a talent manager because no one wants to be managed. They want to be taught. They want to be led, right? And, and how is that, is, what do you feel about that? 
being uh, being a, a not a talent manager, but being a talent coach, a talent leader. Yeah, it's funny. I've never heard it put that way, Ed, but I can see the logic behind it. The idea is management isn't a bad thing. It's just management as a concept still harkens back to the 19th century and, or, you know, or early 20th century, Henry Ford, you know, lines of car parts coming down. A, that's not what it is anymore, right? We know that emotional intelligence is critical in the workplace. Soft skills are critical, especially when you're managing people remotely or people across the globe. And it's the trust that they have in their boss that's key. The final thought I'd say to that point, though, Ed, is this. Beingness trumps doing this. When I ask people, when I teach at UCLA, tell me about your favorite boss, and they start to raise their hands, they say things like, you know, she was someone who always made, feel like my, made me feel like my opinion mattered. I always had a seat at the table with her. Or he challenged me to do things I didn't even think I was ready to do. He seemed to have more faith in me than I had in myself. And, and you go around the table, and the students are basically giving the same answers. And the aha moment is... You guys, are you describing their beingness or their doingness? Are you describing who they are or are you describing what they do? And the students first say, well, both. I said, yeah, I know both, but go down to the core. And what they realize is it's the beingness. It's, their, it's how you respect them. It's how they treat you. There's an element of competence there. There's an element of respect. There's an element of likability. And my point is we're chasing our tails, trying to do, do, do things when the reality is to be someone's best favorite boss they've ever had. You just have to be a certain way. It's easier than we're making it. We just have to be a certain way and people will automatically gravitate to you, towards you because you have that reputation and you're that kind of caring person. So the, uh, the new website is paulfalconehr.com. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's cool. Will you please come back again soon? <laughs> I will come down. And, and I would love it. You are my favorite. I love it. Thank you for inviting Thank me. You. Thank you. It means you. the world. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. And, and muzzle toe. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you.